Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. I wish to start today's program by wishing all of you a very happy set of holidays. Over the next three weeks, we're going to be uh, dealing with some programs uh, to celebrate the various holidays for various uh, communities across the world. And on today's program, we have two guests that we've had here before, and we're delighted to have them back. And one of the things that we like to celebrate during those holidays are stories for children. And our two guests are here to talk about a new book called Kaleidoscope, a collection of tantalizing tales. And I have a copy of the book here that I would like to show to our viewers, and uh, we highly recommend it for um, our viewers. In fact, there is a review of it in which uh, the person says, Kaleidoscope is filled with enough magic, mystery, and fantasy to stir anyone's imagination. Engaging, read aloud stories and poems, create an adventurous escape for the whole family, experience the joy of sharing these tantalizing tales, and this was written by Patricia Kempthorne, the First Lady of the State of Idaho. With that, I'm very pleased to welcome to the program, first of all, Mary Smith. She is the president of the Coeur d'Alene chapter of the Idaho Writers League. And next to her is Patty Dickinson, who is the vice president of the Coeur d'Alene chapter of the Idaho Writers League and, and a well-known author. And we've had her here with a, one of her great books and its success. But welcome to both of you. We've had you before, and we're happy, happy to have you back. And congratulations for what you do for the Idaho Writers League. Thank you. And I'm very pleased to have our regular panelist, Janelle Burke, who will start today's questioning. Christmas is such a wonderful <clears throat> time of the year, and it lends itself very well to your book, Kaleidoscope. Um, and your, that book is, would be a perfect stocking stuffer <laughs> for someone. Um, can you please tell us how you started on this project and, and, and what it's about? So let's start with Patty and ask her how you started on this project. And then Mary can explain uh, what it's all about. Sure. Uh, the book was actually uh, born last Christmas uh, when, uh, for our chapter meeting, uh, our members were asked to write a children's story, each one. And we heard a lot of comments like, I don't write children's stories, I write mysteries, I write romance, I write this, that. And we said, that's all right, write it, it'll be good for you. So in December, when we came together for our meeting, we each read our stories and they were delightful. And it occurred to us, what a shame it would be if the children that we wrote for in our minds never got to hear these stories. So I phoned the Children's Village and asked them if we could come and read. Then a comment was made to uh, Marge and Tom Murphy, who are uh, members, very important members uh, that back the Children's Village. And their immediate response was, you should put those into a book to benefit the children's village. <laughs> and that was at Christmas time last year, and the book debuted on May 19th, five months later. So here we are with a book. And, and Mary, what is the book about? The book is a collection of tantalizing tales and poetry. And it's for children of all ages. It's fun for adults to read. We have uh, firemen and uh, fathers and mothers and all kinds of adults who love this book because they keep it in the car by them and read it at stoplights and uh, slow traffic and you know all of those places because you can finish a story very quickly. Um, there are stories for young people. It's from ages 9 to 14, uh, advanced 14-year-olds or uh, nine-year-olds enjoy. We have some very nice stories. It's just a collection of different kinds of stories. Some of them are, are uh, true. Louise Shattuck's story, of course, of Katie, is the true story of a sheepdog. Uh, we have some wonderful poetry. And uh, so it's just one of those books. You open it up and there's something wonderful on that page. Now, <clears throat> since it is, as, as, a, as the title indicates, it's a series of stories, how many authors do you have in here approximately? About 26 altogether. Uh, I think 16 of those are uh, story authors of stories, and then the other 10 are poetry, uh, poetry authors. So altogether, there are 26 people represented in the book. Well, thank you very much. I, I think that uh, since we are here, and I'm, I, I'm sure we have families watching, sitting around the fireplace, <laughs> and the trees are up, and 
special foods on the table and all Snowing those kinds of things. Snowing outside. Snowing. Well, <laughs> since we're taking this program early, we might all be cautious about it. It might be a, sun, a snowy day and it may not, but hopefully it will be for the holidays. Uh, let's start with some stories for our children because that's the purpose of this program is celebrating with the children. And uh, so some of our viewers who don't have the book yet, and later we'll talk about in the program if they'll get a pen where they can get the book, uh, maybe that you could read a story or two to the children as they sit around with their families on this very peaceful time. Uh, and uh, Mary, shall we start with you and, and pick out one that you really want to read and enjoy? Well, if you don't mind, we're not going to read a whole story. Right. Because if we do, then you'll hear the story and you won't want to buy the book. What we want to do is make you really want to buy this book <laughs> because it's wonderful. And so, um, one of the stories that I'd like to share with you is uh, one by David Hibbard, and it's called Deep Dark Secrets. And you will read a portion of that. Oh, yes. No, I'm not going to read the whole story. Heart pounding, lungs straining for air, I struggle to pass Brett. Sweat darkened my Spider-Man t-shirt and my legs burned from our long bike ride. Brett raced his mountain bike ahead with me in hot pursuit. Just once, that's all I ask. One time, let me beat Brett at something. And we leave it there. And we leave it there. And you have those <laughs> hanging in suspense. <laughs> and those children at home that are saying to mother and dad, oh, why didn't she finish it, you know? <laughs> So we'll, we'll pass on that, though, and uh, not insist on you finishing the story. But Well, it's a, it's a rather lengthy story. It's a rather long one. And it's about two, uh, two boys, three boys, that uh, go into a cave. And have an adventure. Have a tremendous adventure, adventure. in a cave. And so you were reading from the introduction as it was starting right. out. Right. Yes, but you get a flavor of, right. you know, it's, it's a good story. Mary, I think there'd be another thing that would be interesting about this book, and it is that when, Many books you read, it's by one author, and so you have the same writing style and same theme through the process. But what's nice about this is that you have a flavor of, of if you indicated a, a, at least 26 authors. And so you, you should go from one to the other when you get a different style and different flavor. It's fun. Patty's got a deep one. Well, this one, uh, this is the story of the adventures of Ivan Pusikov, true Russian blue. Now, this is a cat who does not lack for self-esteem. And it's written in the first person present, which is, is a different style. Right. I use many identities, but most cats know me as inspector. My name is Ivan Pusikov. I am the one, the only true Russian blue. That means my ancestors were pure aristocrats from the old country. Now I am American. I have a credit card and I watch football on television. I live in a cold part of the United States, as you would expect a true Russian blue to do. My home and office are in Idaho, near the Canadian border, where in winter it snows and the lakes turn to ice like in Russia. Idaho winters make my lustrous gray fur grow even more magnificent. My fur is so magnificent, sometimes I scare myself. I am the cat from St. Petersburg, the cat that came in from the cold, Agent Double O, to my closest compatriots. I am a spy. What is it that I do? I am the Northwest Director of FFB, the Fearless Feline Bureau, similar to your CIA. My job is to protect our country from international cat burglars and spies. This very moment, I hear my cax machine beeping, my whiskers. The message is from the White House and signed by President Sox. The White House, Washington, D.C. To Ivan Pusikov, Northwest Director, FFB, from Sox. President of United States CATS, date, right this minute. Message, dangerous international spy cat reportedly approaching Idaho-Canada border. Capture alive if possible. His name, Alexander the Persian. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> but I have to say that since that was written, uh, President Sox has, uh, <laughs> term has ended. And <laughs> we have another president, uh, uh, animals but in the she, White House. But she is still there. Her ghost haunts the White House. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see. Who, who wrote that particular one? I happened to write that one. Oh, and so. that was the one that Tom Murphy fell in love with that he oh, wanted yes. to make sure that was in the book. And so Alex, uh, uh, Ivan Pusikov indeed uh, does go after Alexander. And of course, he's going to capture his cat. 
and he does such a good job that President Sox invites him to uh, the White House, and, and there's a second story in there where he uh, heads up the uh, security for an international peace summit with delegates like Yasser Arakat and Sir Edward Puss from Great Britain. <laughs> and <laughs> Ivan has, he's such a unique cat that he even has his own um, dictionary uh, which explains to children in their terms what some of the words mean like um, uh, uh, distinguishes, act like a hero, debonair is way beyond cool, uh, spectacles are uncool glasses, and uncanny, totally weird, unexplainable. So he oh, has. Well, that's the very important to have the definitions. Oh, that's right. right. Expanding the vocabulary. Of, yeah, of exactly. Children. Yes, yes, yes. Right. yes. It's, it's on the, in the back. In yes, the very back. Yes, of the he, yeah. he has. And magnificent. Like he has magnificent fur. Magnificent is beyond cool. Oh, I see. <laughs> Thank you. Janelle Burke. Well, I'm at an advantage here because I have the table of contents and I'm looking at it and there are such wonderful names to the stories and so <laughs> forth. And so let's just go down and review some of those. Um, Mary, let's start with you and, and uh, talk about on the, on the first page of the table of contents what some of the really interesting names are here. We have, of course, the adventures of Ivan Pussykoff that we just heard about. But there's also one, a horse named Star. Uh, munching with Mary. <laughs> and, oh, that's um, <laughs> <laughs> now, honestly, that is not me. And that a Christmas section yeah. as well. Um, the Christmas Eve Sestina. Uh, the parents' night before Christmas. That oh. might oh, interest that's good. some that of us. Would you like to hear Munching with Mary? Yes, that is I so would. Cute. This is I love very it. cute. This is written by Helen Campbell. Mary had a little lamb, some ravioli, and some ham. A lobster quiche, a turkey thigh, some jelly beans, and lemon pie. We thought that she was done, but then she called the waiters back again. Some sausage pizza, if you please, with collard greens and black-eyed peas. When finally we had to go, this maid had licked the platters clean. And though her lamb was white as snow, poor Mary was ghastly green. <laughs> <laughs> and on the second page of the table of contents, we find uh, Santa on the 4th of July. That oh. sounds like a very interesting We'd love to interesting share a little story. bit of that. Would and a like wild to? kangaroo roundup. But let's go back to Santa on the 4th of July. All right. Santa on the 4th of July was written by Barbara Rostad. Santa stared at his computer screen and shook his head. He tugged his beard and frowned. There was some mistake. Who would order 182,000 yards of star-spangled blue material? The Christmas frenzy always bordered on panic, but 182,000 yards of red and white stripes and 182,000 yards of star-spangled blue? Maybe one of the elves was playing a trick. The rascal snowflake could be the culprit. He was always up to something. Why, just last week, he put Rapunzel Barbie dolls on the eight-year-old boy's Christmas list. The more Santa thought about it, the more his suspicions deepened about Snowflake. He definitely was capable of this computer caper. Blast that elf, anyhow. Mrs. Claus entered her husband's study. She carried a large oval tray, tray of frosted sugar cookies decorated with red and green sprinkles for the elves. He'd like one himself, but right now this odd order required his undivided attention. What elf, dear? He swiveled around. Snowflake. He's been fooling around again. This time he entered a fake order for endless bolts of some strange fabric. Mrs. Claus set the cookies down on a small table near the door. What strange fabric? Well, I don't know exactly, Santa gestured toward the screen. Yards and yards of red and white striped cloth and more yards and yards of blue cloth, cloth with white stars. Obviously some kind of joke. He scowled. His wife, her long plaid Christmas skirt rustling with each step, walked up behind him and began massaging his shoulders. It's no joke, dear. I filled out the order you see on the screen. It's for flags. Flags? Santa looked black. Flags? Flags, Mrs. Claus repeated. Her voice was firm. 
American flags, one for every American child. Flags, questioned Santa, more puzzled than ever. Leave that to the 4th of July people. He rose from his computer desk, arms akimbo, and peered at her over his glasses. I don't do the 4th of July. He paused to let the red words register, then, at a measured pace, added, it's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just amazed at the authors, aren't you, Janelle? They're wonderful stories, and we could go right on through this this uh, table of contents. It's just delightful. The 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 um, way that they're, the stories are described are beautiful, and their titles are wonderful and and very intriguing. So I know people will want to have the book. It's such a great way to sit here during the holidays and share with our, our viewers too, because I'm sure that everyone is in the mood to to be with family and to, and to deal with some those beautiful stories. I'm going to pause at this point and ask our staff to put up on the screen where they could contact you for the book. Uh, if they will do that at this time, I believe you have a website uh, and also a telephone number and an address. And so if they could put those up and maybe while they're doing there, they come on the screen. Mm -hmm. and so. The, this is the Children's Village, and this is the phone number, and also the website. And They're for available. those that might be in another room, you might mention what right. they are. They're available. The books can be purchased uh, two ways. They can be purchased directly from the Children's Village in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, by calling them at 208-667-1189. Um, and they do offer uh, uh, discounts for large orders. Uh, and they can also be ordered online at www thechildrensvillage.org and they can be paid for by, on, by PayPal with a credit card online. So they're quite easy uh, to order. Well, thank you. And uh, we should talk a little bit about too that the profits from your book are not something that you authors are going to get. That, that's, this is part of our, uh, this is one of our community projects as part of the, uh, our chapter's 60th anniversary. We just celebrated our 60 years of founding. Our chapter was founded in 1943, and we wanted to do a worthwhile community project. And every author in here has signed over the rights within this book, and 100% of the cost of the book goes to uh, build, uh, to the children's village, they want to build a third home. They have two now, and they're they're turning away children, uh, unfortunately. Uh, Mary, would you come in? You're familiar with this too, and uh, for our viewers in other states or at a distance, tell us a little more about the Children's Village. The Children's Village was established ten years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a home for abused, abandoned, and children at risk. Uh, oh, between 900 and 1,000 children have gone, spent time with Children's Village, and they are running out of room. They are having to turn away children, and so they have two beautiful homes, the Moyer, Moyer and the Miller homes, but they need a third home desperately, and so the funds from this book will begin the fundraising for that third, third, third home. A little footnote here that's tied to this program, the founder of the village, uh, the Children's Village, uh, Dr. Ann Fox, was on this program, and she had two children in her school. She was an educator here at the time, and as a uh, little boy and little girl, and they had been divided into different homes uh, after there was a breakup of their family. And so she brought them both into her office and said, I promise you that this is not going to happen in the future. When you can stay together, we're going to create a, a home for children. And that was the, the beginning of her long crusade for that along with other people that, that supported it. That is such a wonderful story. That is such, and, that, and that young man was on um, one of the ships that was uh, recently featured on television. Yes. He was a, a seaman. Yes. So that, you know, that was years yeah. ago and that, that story yeah. broke. And I remember her being on the program talking about she'd made that commitment to those two children. Right. Let's have another story at this time. And Patty, I believe you have one that you would like to yes. read. Yes. Uh, well, there's all kinds of stories. This one happens to be science fiction, and it's called Rick Porter, Supreme Commander. It's written by Larry Tellis, who actually did all of the graphics uh, within the book. 
Rick Porter couldn't believe his eyes. There had to be a hundred buttons, dials, gauges, switches, and digital readouts on the master cons console in front of him. There were silver and black dials, some marked with lines, others with large red numbers. A few were behind glass windows marked caution. There were gauges, some horizontal, others vertical, all over the console, and lots of lights, red ones, green and yellow ones, some that glowed steadily and others that blinked. Wow, I've always dreamed of how it would be in the cockpit of a spaceship. This is what it must be like. Well, this young man, Rick Porter, guides in a spaceship right into the grounds where he is, and then he, he has to help this alien in the spaceship get back to his planet. So there, the ideas that are represented in this book are, are as diverse as the people that are in our chapter. You know, just all kinds of great ideas. We have Bartholomew Banks, this young story of a young boy who wants to uh, earn some money to buy a, what was it? A it's, it's a video game. And so he has adventures in babysitting. <laughs> uh, help her. Well, these are great bedtime stories. They and are. not only are they great bedtime stories, but anyone who buys the book is supporting a very worthwhile cause. Absolutely. But uh, you have been involved for a good long time in writer's leaks. And uh, I want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about that for those people who are aspiring writers out there in the community. So let's start with Mary. I believe you probably have been the member longest here in Coeur d'Alene, perhaps, or longer than I Patty. Not really. Patty's been longer here, but the, one of the lovely things about the Idaho Writers League is it is a league of chapters. And I was a member of the Twin Falls chapter back in 1985 I joined, so I've been a member quite some time. And so it's really fun to be a member there and then be able to transfer membership up here. And, and, and Patty, what are some of the activities that a Writers League has? Well. Our our mission statement, as it were, is to uh, to help our members raise their professionalism, their, their writing skills, by bringing in speakers, by our monthly programs. Uh, we have critiques, uh, critique groups within. We meet once a month uh, here in Coeur d'Alene uh, in the daytime uh, at the Jewett House. In, in the evening, we have an evening meeting for those writers who work. We each bring things to the uh, meetings and share, and we, we call it, we get back TLF, tender loving feedback, on how to improve our writing. But it is to raise the awareness about writers and writing, to offer the opportunity for people who are interested in writing to come and meet other writers. And you benefit from the networking of that. And this doesn't mean that you necessarily have to have a goals of becoming a professional writer, it no. means that you might be someone who enjoy memoirs. writing about your family, memoirs, uh, right. or memoirs, as you're saying, or perhaps a family tree type stories, uh, or it could be writing about pets. Um, it can anything. be hobby writing. You know, we we have what we call hobby writers who who really don't have any uh, desire necessarily to be published, but like you said, they want to leave a legacy about their family or uh, by writing their memoirs or, uh, you know, so there's really quite a variety. And not everybody wants to be published. <laughs> and that's a whole other program. <laughs> <laughs> so you're indicating that some people come to your, uh, or actually belong to the League and, and they like to write and maybe improve, but they don't have any intention of ever publishing it. It's something they will have for themselves or their family. And you, yes, but you know the funny thing is that some of those people who start out that way end up different. End up, I want to be published. <laughs> and uh, we have several members who uh, came to us that had books started years ago and ended up because we kind of got them going and encouraged them, who ended up being published. So, and of course now every one of these authors can say they are a published author, which, which yes. is very satisfying. Uh, just one other quick question to you, Patty, because we've had you on the program with your book that you did, and it's, um, it was a delightful book to read, and so let's just let you take a moment to tell them about your book and the cowboy. Yeah, well, that, uh, the book is called Hollywood the Hard Way, A Cowboy's Journey, and it's the true story of a cowboy who in 1946 
uh, to honor a bet that his grandfather made, rode his horse from Guthrie, Oklahoma to Hollywood, California. That's getting there the hard way. <laughs> and um, he uh, and I heard about the uh, story on a way to a writer's conference. And of course, he made it or I wouldn't have written the story. But it, uh, it was optioned for a movie, and it's actually being looked at again. Okay. So, Well, I commend you. I know that you had a chance to have a movie, but you weren't going to agree to it. If they're going to make major changes in That's your book. That's right. More authors should be that way. <laughs> we have about two and a half minutes left, and I think it'd be great to end the program with another story. Which one of you would like to read another one, Mary? Would you like a poem? Yes, that would be great. We have a, a, a charming poem called... The Parents' Night Before Christmas. How's that? That's a good one. Yeah. All right. This is again by Marilyn Wagenius. Twas the night before Christmas, and all down the block, parents were frantically racing the clock, fitting A slot into C slot and bending B under. Fathers were mumbling or tore boxes, toy boxes asunder. The children were finally asleep in their beds, and visions of spaceships zoomed through their heads. The very ones offered each day on TV at a discount now, only $59.93. Weeks ago, all the children made their long list of fabulous items that shouldn't be missed, and Mom shot in Nikes and I capped in, capped in hat had just gone to the mall to purchase all that. Having spent all our money in massive amounts, we kept right on toying with charge accounts. <laughs> so here we are at home, and I now that I tremble to think of all the boxes marked unassembled, when what to my wondering eye should appear but a sheaf of instructions, too garbled, I fear, for a frustrated father to translate and perform. But I tackled the job with the fury of storm, doing step one through step four with frequent false starts. I invariably ended up with assorted spare parts. I'm Yet sorry I to interrupt, but <laughs> there you are. Anyway, they can buy the book and get the rest of that story. I bet you're happy I did interrupt. Oh, I'm thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful story. But, uh, they will have to get the book and then finish, finish the it up. It. Yes. I want to thank you both, uh, Patty and Mary, for being on the program. It's always so fun oh, having you here. You. You're so ener energetic <laughs> and, and so wonderful in your, your skills. And as always, Janelle Burke, thank you so much for being a panelist. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to take this time to hope that all of you and to wish that all of you have, throughout these different holidays, a wonderful time. And I want to say Happy Hanukkah and Merry Christmas. and each of you wonderful people celebrating whatever you do and we hope that the season is great for you and that as we move into another year uh, that you will have a great year in the year uh, 2004 and as we've been doing this for 34 years we hope we can continue to wish you a great season in the future uh, next week we'll turn to yet another issue until then please have a good week i am tony stewart The Public Forum Production staff at North Idaho College wish you and yours a happy holiday season. <laughs>